Hey, Monday Night Men, I'm fired up you're here. This is part two of our series on increase, building strong men to build strong churches. And uh, Jeremiah 29.7, you heard it right, not 29.11. We talked about that last week. If you didn't see that, go back and look at it. But 29.11, uh, we all know it. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, the plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Great scripture, but the context is what's key. And, he, and God's talking to some people who are in bondage, they're in slavery, they're in Babylon, a bad place. And uh, he says, plant gardens, eat the food, have children, find spouses, multiply. And then here's the scripture that's our scripture for this series. Jeremiah 29, 7. Work for the success of the city I have sent you to. Pray to the Lord for that city. If it succeeds, you too will enjoy success. Here's another translation, NIV, and David will put this up. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And I, and I love this, because this is, this is, again, I want to come back one more time to Abraham in Genesis, when he's, when he's taken Isaac up, and God's provided the sacrifice, and, but Abraham's faith has launched him into a new dimension. He becomes the father of faith. The angel said to Abraham, because you have done this thing and not withheld your son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So what we do in ministry to men is about blessing the city we are in, because when the city is blessed, we are also blessed. Somebody who's doing that really well is, uh, is uh, Fabio Nishimura, Marcos Pohl, and all of our great friends in Brazil. Uh, David put up, uh, David's going to put up, Bryce is here shooting for us. He's a producer for our Brave Men podcast. And let me mention again, we are in the West Callahan Global Media Center Christian Men's Network Studios. Down at that end of the studio is where we shoot all the translations and the teaching. We did stuff from Mexico yesterday, Vietnam a few weeks ago. And this is the podcast area. There's a microphones. You can't see everything, but you can see it when you're on the podcast. But the Brave Men podcast, make sure you're there, you're uh, clicked in. And make sure on the Christian Men's Network YouTube, if you're there, click on subscribe because that algorithm helps us reach more people. But uh, David's going to put up this Brazil uh, photos. And, and when I talk about blessing the city, Marcos, Fabio, and the men from, and George Nishimura, our friends from University of the Family and Christian Men's Network Brazil are blessing city after city. Over 9,000 groups that are going across the nation of Brazil. And I have met, and I'll be down there again in a couple months, I've met so many people who have told me, hey, Something changed. Something shifted. Our church started to grow. It's blessed our city. Because when you bless, when men change, everything begins to change. It changes the way people do business. It changes the way they father. So uh, you see some of those shots of the events down in Brazil. Marcos, Fabio, those guys are crushing it. Just because those texts over the last couple of days. So well done, men. Uh, well done. Now, here's, here's the thing. When we talk about increase, when we talk about building strong men and strong churches, I want you to just write this down, inside, outside, inside, outside. It is first the heart, then the hands. So, so write that down. In fact, uh, circle it. Write it down, circle it. First the heart, then the hands. And we go back to Isaiah 3. David, let's put this up. Isaiah 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, Behold, the Lord of hosts takes away from Jerusalem. Now, come back to me. This is Isaiah bringing a word from God, correcting Israel. Israel has, is doing what you and I do so often. Things are going tough. Lord, help me with this. God, I've got to make payroll tomorrow. Whatever the thing is, we just, Lord, help me. You want to need a miracle? And then when we're going well, we're like, yeah, we're good. I'm good. I'm good. And we tend to distance that relationship a little bit. Ah, we're good. So Israel has said, hey, we're good. We don't need you. We're good. We're fine. God says, okay, you don't need me? Let's see what happens. 
And he says this, he says, I'm going to take away from Jerusalem and from Judea your security, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. Now, what this speaks of right there, security, bread, water, is the triune God. This speaks of security, the Father, bread, Jesus, supply of water, a type of the Holy Spirit. So he says, I'm going to take my presence from you. See how well you do. And then he says, I'm going to take two people out of the culture. When I take these two people out of the culture, he says, the culture will begin to tip over. We've got construction going on out here uh, on the residence that's on this property that the Lord put together. Many of you gave to make sure this studio got built. And I mean, this thing's anointed in here. I get I walk in every time I'm, I'm in town and, and walk in the studio. We're doing productions, whatever it is. I go, Scott, this is... This is your place, your house. It is anointed, filled with his presence. And so guys, so this, this uh, construction is going on. And there are some walls and bricks. And if they take a brick out of the bottom before it's put together, that wall just comes down. So he says, I've got two people I'll take out of the culture. And it's like these two bricks. If I take these out, everything begins to tip over. He says, if these two people come out of your culture, it's going to begin to tip over. And here's what it is. The mighty man and the and the man of war. It's the hero and the warrior, the mighty man and the man of war. Uh, another translation is the hero and the warrior. Every great culture has been built on the character of its heroes and the courage of its warriors. The character of its heroes and the courage of its warriors. Character, courage, inside, outside. Inside, character. What's exhibited from character on the outside is courage. The willingness to stand, to say, this is what we believe. This is who we are. This is where we're at. Okay. Now, great cultures has, have always been built on the character of its heroes and the courage of its warriors. It's true of every great culture. It's true of every great family. It's true of every great church. I mean, we just have to look around. You know, masculinity, manhood is in crisis the world's confused. The Bible, the word's not confused because we have a model of what a Christ-like man looks like. Looks like Jesus. Manhood and Christ-likeness are synonymous. That's, that's been the word for 48 years for the Christian Men's Network since my father, Dr. Ed Cole, began this at his kitchen table in 1977 with his family. He said, God's called me into a ministry to men to imprint them with the message that manhood and Christ-likeness are synonymous. To be a real man is to be more like Jesus. But here's the issue in our culture. You know, I mean, think about this. 93% of our 13-year-olds that are in our churches today will be gone by the time they reach college. Something's wrong with that picture. What do we need? We need fathers. We need men of God. We need men who impute and incarnate, help incarnate Christ into the lives and hearts of young men and young women. Basically, it has to be here. The, the issue is, for instance, here, here's another stat. Four million babies where I live in the United States of America, four million babies this year. 3.4 million of those babies will be born to men without a biblical worldview. In many of those cases, the man's not there. Think about that. 3.4 million children out of the four million born to men without a biblical worldview without a basis for masculinity, the impending crisis from that is massive. Think about the exponential increase of that. I mean, we live right now, in, in the last stat I saw from uh, Toby, uh, who was on, uh, Toby Slough, who was on the Brave Men podcast. He said 500 students a day are being admitted into some sort of medical care because of anxiety or stress, just in the U.S., 500 students a day. So the, the concept is, you know, our mission, our mission is not just getting guys into books and materials. Our mission is Jesus. Our mission is carrying the Word of God and getting it into the hearts of men. Because when we deal with fatherlessness, we reduce poverty, we change the issues and structure and things that are going on in culture. So, so and here's one other thing. This is just another little side stat, if you will. When we talk about building churches and building buildings and doing the work of the ministry, 90% of the, 
of the funding to build churches globally, this is a global stat, 90% of the funding to build churches comes from one group, and that group is men. So when you minister to men, there's increase in those areas. In fact, I'm going to give you the areas of increase. Because we're going after, you and I, going after the largest unreached people group in the world, and that's men. Oh, here's another stat that I wrote down. 68% of Christian men struggle with unwanted sexual behavior. 68% of Christian men struggle with unwanted sexual behavior. In other words, whether it's uh, an addiction, uh, porn, uh, whatever it is, they don't want to do it, but they, they struggle with it. Then you've got the pharmaceuticals, alcohol, gambling, uh, all of those sorts of things. We're in the middle of the destruction of moral absolutes. And so the church needs a system to speak at that. That's why we have the launch kit. Where's the, where's the uh, deal on that? That's why we have the launch kit. Here it is. Uh, the Momentum Guide. Why do we have these things? All these tools, 140 pages of how to do ministry to men. Why do we have a 12-part series, majoringmen.com? All of that to give us a system to minister to men. Because when we do that, we change the city that we're in. And then here's what happens. See, because it's like uh, Dwayne Pickett, he said, I always had pastor of uh, New Jerusalem in Jackson, Mississippi. He said, I always had a passion to reach our men. I just didn't have a pattern. I always had a passion, just didn't have a pattern. Well, here's the system. Here's the pattern. To take maximized manhood, get it into the hearts of men. Get the word of God in them. When, when men start into this, what happens is the taste. It's like David said. He said, he said, when I taste honey, he said, when I taste the word of God, it's like tasting honey. It tastes good, and I want more of it. So when men begin to walk into righteousness, they like, hey, I want more of that. Walk into a freedom in Christ. Hey, I want more of that. And so rather than being, uh, if you will, pushed down by the law, we're set free by the grace of God in faith. And here's what, here's, there's six things that happen when we begin to minister to men in the local church. And I'll break some of this apart in the next couple of weeks. Uh, number one, there's increased salvations. Number two, there's increased growth. Thirdly, there's increased workers. Fourth, there's increased giving. Five, there's increased influence. And number six, it says increased personal time. What that means is for those who are ministers, particularly vocational ministers, uh, it gives you more time to be able to do the work of the ministry because you've got men who are doing the work. You've also got men who are healthier, and you've got men, and your counseling load goes down. And now you've got men who take care of their friends. You know, a guy has a problem or an issue, and a friend shows up. It's, just, it's not just, hey, call the pastor. Pastor needs to know, but he doesn't need to be the guy that's on the front lines every single time. He needs some other warriors, right? Gideon's 300. That's you. All right, so in the launch kit, uh, in this launch kit, I keep throwing it over out of uh, arm's reach, in this launch kit, in the Momentum Guide, are some things I want to break them apart. And you can order this at cmn.men. And also, hey, very cool thing we're, we're doing in this, just this series of seven weeks. Uh, we're putting a video from Lion's Roar at the close of each session. And the one today is Otto Kelly. And this thing rocks. In fact, I showed it at a men's conference in Arizona recently. Just showed the whole... 16 minutes and it was like man guys were cheering and clapping and and responding to a video it was awesome and Otto Kelly from Lions Roar and Lions Roar is almost half full for this year which is uh, which is in November 7 through 9 2024 if you're watching it a different year but November 7 through 9 in Dallas and that is uh going to be an amazing time. It's about, it's about equipping, about getting motivated, fueled up, but also equipped. All right, here we go. From the launch kit, there's six things, six key areas that make us effective in the ministry to men. All right, you ready? You write them down. David will put them up. He'll put up just the headline, and I'll kind of break it apart a little bit. Uh, six key areas that we need to go into. Number one, you've got to prepare. Don't just show up, go, hey, uh, oh, I didn't look at this. Is it chapter 6? Chapter 7. <laughs> you know, don't show up and just go, yeah, I don't know what's going on. Show, and don't show up and just go, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to, 
speak with whatever the Lord gives me. Well, the Lord can give it to you a couple days ahead of time, right? So prepare. It was John Wooden who said, failure to prepare is preparation for failure. And it was Bear Bryant who said, the will to win is not the most important thing in a game. He said, it's the will to prepare to win that wins the game. So preparation. Review the materials. Go through the workbook. What's a strong man in tough times? So I got a strong man in tough times. Here's the workbook. Go through it. Make sure you've studied it. Make sure you go through these things. Prepare. And then you may text a few guys and say, hey, uh, hope you're showing up. Hope you've got this thing. It, it, you know what? Uh, I'm talking about increasing your local church group organization. But this is also true for your family. This is all also really key for your family. Prepare your heart. There are times where you need to sit down with your family. In fact, this one right here, Bryce is running a camera. He's also producing our uh, Brave Men podcast, working with us in the ministry on a fractional basis. But Strong Men in Tough Times was the first book that you went through uh, that Grandpa wrote, right? And it was at the kitchen table. You were nine years old. Yeah. You were nine years old going through strong men in tough times, and you did not like getting up Saturday morning for a 9 a.m. thing with well. Dad. Still don't. <laughs> so, uh, so what I'm talking about, these things I'm talking about, uh, you can apply these to your family, to your business, whatever it is, okay? So preparation's key. Number two, uh, number two is you've got, to see, you've got a goal. You've got to have plans. So preparation and then plans. Plan it out. Here's how we're going to do this. Here's a goal to engage hearts. This is what we do with Christian Men's Network. This is what I do. So guys say, what are we supposed to do when we go to Argentina? I said, number one, engage hearts, equip hands, and empower their feet. Equip hearts. In other words, get this word, engage the hearts, get this word fired up, get, get something, you know, the, the stories. That's why we use stories. Get the story going. Then equip their hands. Engage their hearts, equip their hands, and then empower their feet. Just, just it's like the if you could go to majoringinmen.com and you would find there a whole series on these things. But it's that. Have a plan. Have a strategy. Uh, launch for maximum impact, whether it's in your family or your men's group or wherever it may be. All right, or your business. In other words, the. And then as a pastor, make sure you're promoting this. Make sure you're talking about it. Make sure you're telling people, hey, you need to go to that thing Tuesday night. Don't just say, oh, yeah, Bill's doing a thing. Don't just say, yeah, it's Jamal's group. You know, actually say, hey, this is who, what we do. You may not be there as a pastor, or executive pastor, wherever your position is. But, but you can say, hey, this is part of us, part of what we do. All right? And then, and then don't, because men can't go it alone. There's no way you can do this on your own. You need a band of brothers. The disciples needed a band of brothers. That's why Jesus got them together. Okay, so number one is, uh, is, is, pl- is the uh, preparation, then plan. And number three is practices. And what that means is practices is basically another word for rituals. Have a, have a thing you walk through at the end of each class. Have a way that you finish it that's motivating at the end of each 12 week session or eight week session, however you do it, have a way that you honor men for having gone through it. Maybe you do a certificate, maybe it's a badge, maybe it's a coin and you honor them and you have practices and rituals that you go through that make it part of who you are. Okay. As a local church, I've got uh, one friend who had a little card printed out. It was called a man card and on the back were their values of who they are. And you went through the, the class, the small group, whatever it was, and, and you got your man card. So I think those rituals, they'll draw, draw more men in, they'll deepen the connection. And number four is principles. Make sure this, that, and these are values, if you will. This is the value uh, proposition. Make sure your team, and make sure your family knows this is who you are. Principles are the, are, if you will, the core of your identity. This is who we are. This is what we stand for. This is how we live. This is, I mean, this is something I said with my uh, children. This is who we are. This is a, who a coal is. You don't act like that because that's not who we are. 
And that's how we do it with our business. That's not how, that's how we do it with our ministry. That's not who we are. This is not how we act. This is not how we treat people. Okay? So those principles are those values that, that become core to your culture. Remember, everything will have a culture. You are the one who has to provide the core for that. Otherwise, something else or somebody else will. Somebody's going to create that culture. Don't let somebody else do that. You create the core culture for your family, for your business, for your ministry, for the church. And, and really, it comes back to this. It really comes back to this. You need to grow yourself before you try to grow your men. It's the old thing about talk to God first before you talk to your God about your children before you talk to your children about God. So work on you first. It's like the airplane thing, right? When they say, hey, if the mask drops, put yours on first, then help somebody else. Why? Because if you're not healthy, you can't help somebody else get healthy. All right. Uh, proofs is number five is proofs. And what that means basically is this, is that uh, when somebody has something that's happened in their life, bring it out. Do a testimony, proofs. Say, look, at, hey, we talked about this stuff. He went home and prayed with his wife. Dude, tell him what happened. It may take a minute or two. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how articulate, inarticulate. It's the story. It's the story. This Bible wasn't written in chapters and verses. This, this Bible is a series of stories that lead us to Jesus Christ. So they cut it up about 300 years ago to chapters and verses so that in that mindset of the UK and King James guys and all those people, they were able to, you know, make it all work. But it, before that, and, and still today, it's about a story. In fact, uh, my professor in my doctorate program, Leonard Sweet, says, don't get caught up in all the verses. He says, don't get versitis. Look at the whole story. Look at the story. That's why I talked about context with Jeremiah 29. So the proofs, the proofs are part of the story. And now here's the last thing. And um, it's the, also the first thing before the first thing. Okay, it's the last thing, and it's the first thing before the first thing. And that's prayer. Prayer is the power of God that strips away the inconsequential. Prayer is the thing that cuts away the things that don't belong. Prayer is what keeps us focused. Prayer moves the hand of God. Prayer changes us. And now here's another thing. Let me give you a key on this prayer thing. Peace. Pray for the men in your group by name. Pray for your children by name. Pray for your employees by name. Pray for your boss by name. Pray for people by name because prayer produces connection. Prayer produces intimacy with the one you're praying with, the one you're praying, the one you're praying to, the one you're praying with, the one you're praying for. So when you pray for people by name, there's a connection that happens. But pray for your men by name. Pray for wisdom. Pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. Pray for their ability. Pray for people to come across their path. Pray for your children to, that, that mentors will come into their lives that are strong and godly. Pray for them. Uh, pray for the, your employees. Pray for them by name. Otto Kelly's coming up. It's going to be fantastic to talk about identity. Before he does, I want to mention this. We're going to Cairo, Egypt in uh, a couple of months, and uh, we need funding for that. We need help. We need uh, prayer. And if you want to go, let me know, and I'll see if there's a spot on the team. We have a smaller team because of the vehicles that we're in, but there may be a spot left. I'd love to see you there in Cairo, Egypt. And there'll be other trips. We've got one to Vietnam coming up, and I'd uh, love to have you go on that. There's a whole team of men that are going. It's a time of camaraderie. It's a time of ministry. You'll be able to pray over people, speak life over people. It'll be fantastic. And uh, as the Lord leads and lays on your heart, uh, we need to be able to fund the things we're doing in Egypt. Uh, I mentioned it before. We've got these books now in Arabic because there were friends like you who gave and made that happen. Uh, they won't, they're not able to do it themselves there in Egypt. And so we're funding a, a pastor's lunch, and we're funding a men's summit there in Cairo and then in Amman, Jordan. Hey, here's Otto Kelly. Thanks for being with me on, on uh, Monday Night Men. Remember, hope is alive. 
Hope has a name. Hope's name is Jesus. Here's Otto Kelly. Okay, so for the next few minutes, we're going to ask God to take us into his mind and into his heart so that we can see ourselves the way he sees us. We're going to ask God to take us into his mind and into his heart so that we can see ourselves the way he sees us. Because if you see yourself the way God sees you, it changes everything. And it's so important because of what we're dealing with out there is the enemy trying to identify sons and daughters of the living God. And God wants us to understand the importance of recognize how he views us. And he cannot unsee you that way. You're always precious to God. You're always spotless and blameless before him and free from accusation before God. So one of, the, one of the individuals I loved who did this, man, was David. David had the ability. He, in Psalm 139, he says, Lord, I, and maybe it's just me paraphrasing. But it's like, God, I'm jacked up. I need to see how you see me. Because I know what I'll do left to myself. I, I need to see the way you see me, God. So I believe that Psalm 139 is one of those things where God takes David into his heart and mind and said, David, look at you. Through my eyes. It says, oh Lord, you search me and you know me. You you, you know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, oh Lord. You, You hem me in behind and before you've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit, Father? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Now stay with me on this. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Oh, you're not feeling me. You got you to feel this. David said, God, you have fearfully and wonderfully made me. See, see you got to understand, for, for, for almost a decade, I was the executive director of several crisis pregnancy centers. And so I know a lot about women that men, you just, sometimes you just don't need to know about. Sisters are some warriors, man. Okay, forgive me. I'm just telling you. They are. But to recognize the, 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 the wonderful, wonderful uh, miracle of conception. Please understand that uh, 400 million sperm cells, stay with me brothers, you heard this, 400 million sperm cells hit that egg and only one makes it through. Which means my brother, and so you are one in 400 million. Oh, you ain't hearing me. You're not hearing me. One in 400 million, that's like a microscopic United States. And God said, that one right there, that's the one I want, and booted you through the egg. Right, now check it out. And scientists have proven that there's a microscopic burst of light that takes place at conception. Now tell me, what happens when when God said, let there be light? And then after he said, let there be light, he spoke the elements into existence. Don't you know that when that microscopic burst of light happened, God spoke your name. God said, that's my son. That's my daughter. Microscopic burst of light happened at your conception. He wanted all of heaven. He wanted the universe to know that that's my kid. Oh, so you got to know how you got to know how wonderfully special you are. See, see, you get you got to understand that God uniquely handcrafted you, knowing that you have a certain radiance of Him that nobody else can possess but you. Nobody else can do it but you. There's a radiance that no one can talk like you, sound like you, act like you. No one can be you but you. 
And God wants us to recognize and listen, I want a unique expression of myself coming through you. Uniquely handcrafted. Paul, Paul, Paul tripped out. In, in Ephesians chapter 1, he said, he said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. God looked within himself and saw you and at the right time brought you out. Oh, y'all. Was it too late? What's going on? God looked within himself. Not out there. Chose you within himself before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And then he's going to trip out and say, in love, he predestined you to be adopted as his kid. Listen, God wasn't lonely. God wasn't frustrated. God said, listen to me. I want you. And, and there's a way in which you can approach me that nobody else can approach me, which is why he wants you praying for people. You have a way in which you can approach God like none other. And he made sure. See, I know I, I'm weird like this, but see, people say that, that, that you know, oh, I forget who it was, that there's a God-shaped void in all of us. Uh, you know, okay, I can, I, yeah, I get that. But I, I firmly believe there's a willful U-shaped void in God. I'm going to say it again. I, I, listen, I, listen, I'm, not, I'm not saying that nothing, I'm saying that God is powerful, ma- majestic and glorious and good, but I said that God willfully allowed himself to have a place in his heart that only you can feel. Which is why he said, will you please pray? Will you seek my face on behalf of others? Will you seek my face on behalf of those you know who need me? Because I'll listen to you. Listen, Moses wouldn't have had a job if people weren't praying for a deliverer. I'll say it again. I know it's been a long day. Moses wouldn't have had a job if people weren't praying for a deliverer. Why in the world do you think those things bother you? Why do you think they bother you, man? Because God has placed the longing of someone else's prayer inside of you so you'll respond. If you're going to give it up to God, give it up to God. No golf claps. We're men. Please understand, no one can do what you can do. And and no one can speak to that person like you can speak to that person. I am a living example of that. Listen to me. There have been times where things were jacked up in this life, in my life. And God knowing I needed a Mike Mueller. God knowing I need a Dr. Uh, Cole. God knowing I needed those men because he created them specifically, knowing that there was going to be a time in my life I couldn't hear anybody, he couldn't hear his voice through anybody else but them. See, 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 see that, that's, please don't allow the enemy to think that you have no value, that you have no purpose. Your purpose is so unique that God made sure your mom and dad met in order to produce you. See, 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 nobody in this room asked to be born. Which means it had nothing to do with you. Which means that God made sure to produce you because he wanted his radiance shining through you, especially now. You got, you got to understand something. If okay, 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 okay. I, 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 I like church history. So, so if Moses was able to do the things that you were able, are able to do, he'd be here and not you. Amen. That's right. if, if John and, and Paul and Peter and, and Mary and if they can do the things that you could do, they'd be here and you wouldn't. Which means that God's called you to do something that the the reputed ones in scripture that are powerful and wonderful and anointed could not do what you can do. Now, now if this, okay, I mean, maybe I'm looking, maybe I'm looking around, maybe time's running out, I don't know. But maybe I'm just weird, I don't know. Israel surrounded by, maybe, maybe I'm weird. But listen to me. If this is indeed the last days. When Jesus said, 
There's not going to be anything like this have ever happened before and will never happen again. He says it's going to be so messed up, so jacked up, but he got you here. Which means that in, listen, okay, I'll put it to you this way. There's no way in the world in, in sudden death or in overtime that the coach is going to put in the rookies. Don't get me wrong. I, I love, I love, I love history. I love my theology. But I, I listen. But 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 God is saying you're it, not them. I mean, wait, this is this is it. If, if if it's winding down, then God is saying, listen to me. I I want I want. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll be good. Doc. You know when when Jesus did the the miracle of the wine. Remember that? It was in, was in John 2, 3. And they said, and the guy, the master of the banquet goes, dude, you know, normally the, the cheap stuff goes, you know, first. And then, you know, and then they put out the, you know, put the good, good wine. But you have saved the best for last. Yeah. I'll leave it there. I'll, I'll just leave it there. You are the wine. He's saving the best for last. I don't know. You look around. You tell me. Maybe I'm out there. Maybe maybe I'm weird. But I'm telling you, it's getting awfully close. And you're here. Which God has uniquely made you, handcrafted you to be an instrument of his goodness in a time that desperately needs men of God to step up and walk out their covenant agreement with him. All right. I'm going to land this plane because I, I, I'm just one of those like, you know, <laughs> I'm an I'm espresso preacher, man. I just like, you know, short, potent to the point. My, oh, my wife liked to call me like coffee, hot, strong and black. <laughs> That's my wife. <laughs> Honey, if you're watching, I, I love you. <laughs> but I want to pray. We got, we got some things to do tonight and I just want to pray. I want God to remind you of who you really are. That God will silence angels to hear from you. That God is saying that you are my son, you are my daughter, talk to me because I'll respond. You look, you look in scripture, there's, there's every, every man and woman of God utilize their influence with God for someone else. And God is wanting you to do the same thing. You have influence with the living God. And because you have influence with God, God is expecting you to utilize that influence to change the lives of those around you. And some of us, I'm telling you, I know, believe me, I need it. (laughs) Just this week, me and Paul had a great conversation. I don't know if I'm going to go, dude. I was, you know, doing a little bit of whining and just go, dude, you should show up, dude. (laughs) You should show up. (laughs) All right, man, I'm, I'm there. But my point is, if God wouldn't have created that man the way that he did, I wouldn't have heard God through him telling me, show up, son. So I just want you all on your feet real quick because we're, 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 this plane this plane's landed. And I just want to pray real quick. It won't take long. But I just want to pray real quick because some of us have forgotten the fact that God created everything. But he not only created you, but he paid for you. Which means that you are the most expensive treasure in time and eternity because he paid for you. He bankrupt heaven for you. That's how valuable you are to the living God. And I, I believe God wants us to have a refreshing understanding of the fact that not only are you that uniquely handcrafted by God and that powerful in God, He wants to let you know that you're endowed with power to go and do what he's called you to do. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this time. I thank you, Lord God, for these men and women of God. I thank you for these men, Lord God, who recognize that they are your sons. And because they're your sons, Lord, there's a unique way in which they can approach you and you'll respond. 
I'm praying, Lord God, that there would be a fresh deposit of your spirit. That they recognize that God, that they and we are your offspring. The very same spirit that rose Christ from the dead is in us. God, you tell us that we smell like our daddy. That we spread abroad the knowledge and the fragrance of Christ everywhere we go. And you always lead us in triumphal procession in him. Lord God, wherever we go, we smell like you. So Lord, help us to be reminded of that truth. That we are to God the aroma of Christ. And God, we choose to walk in that aroma, to walk in that power in a world that desperately needs to see you through your sons. That's all Jesus did. Submit himself to you. And because of that, the world was able to see the heart of the Father through God the Son. And we're your sons. Allow them to see you through us. In Jesus' name, amen.